Brandon Cobb, welcome back to the REI Diamond Show. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm I'm back on the show, so I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for having me. Nice. Yeah. So in preparation for today's episode, now I'll uh, reference that buyers can go back and check out your previous episode. The title was Nashville, Tennessee Real Estate Development, and that was in June of 2022. And rather than have you do the origination story and how you got to the place that you're at today, that's all on that original episode. But what we were talking about at the time, uh, you were very excited about new construction. You guys had some projects going. And I believe we were in the, the papering engineering design phase of a land development deal. I don't remember how many lots. It was 10, 20. It was not like a three lot development, but you were essentially going to put the curbs in here. Um, and, and for the listeners, this is like the Nashville, Tennessee market, Tennessee market in general. And you were talking about putting the curves in and then selling off those pads, I think, to individual builders or maybe the national builders. But maybe you could kind of pick up where we left off last time and give us a report on maybe how those that early or those early development deals with the curves and the, the build ready pad sites went, Brandon. Yeah, so it, it it was one of the best deals that we did. It was kind of funny. We sort of accidentally got into doing land development. We originally wanted to build that deal. It was for 36 townhomes. We had the lot across the street that was slated for 34 single family homes. So all in all, it was about 70 homes total that it was slated for. And, you know, we got a knock on the door while we were going to put the curbs and everything in, you know, it was basically getting ready to be finished from a national builder. And they said, hey, uh, you know, we want to buy this from you. And we're all ready to go vertical on these townhomes. And we're like, eh, no, it's not for sale. Sorry. You know, and they were persistent and like, well, what if we offered this for you? And we said, it's for sale now. And that's sort of how we got into doing the finishing pads and selling them to builders. Those turned out fantastic. And, you know, since then, we've really doubled down on that specific strategy because it's been working really well. Any land that's slated for entry level housing, first time home buyers has just been really hot. So we've been working with the LGI Homes, the Lennars, the uh, DR Hortons to move entitled land or de contract, develop, and sell land to them. You know, we're still building houses, but, you know, if I'm being honest with everything that's gone on with single family houses and interest rates right now, that inventory has just not moved at the pace that the development has been. So it's been a huge success. We've got probably six, 700 units currently in the pipeline that we're either rezoning and titling or developing right now. Nice. Can we go through play by play? So 36 townhomes and the 34 single families, which city was this? Uh, this was in a suburb right outside Nashville, probably 30, 40 minutes away, called White Bluff, Tennessee. Okay. Did you guys have sewer or were these septic lots? Everything we do is always sewer and septic. Though I will say we're looking at one in Murfreesboro that we're willing to do septic on just because everybody does septic in that market. You almost have to, and every national builder's in there. But up to this point, we've only done density where we can put in the sewer and the water. So you have sewers here. You got 70 houses, uh, townhouses. Did you guys buy that land outright in that in those instances? Were there two separate deals there? Uh, they were two separate deals. So two separate sellers literally right next to each other. And it was just in a really good spot, close to downtown, access the city sewer and water, easy grading plan. I mean, it was super straightforward. Whenever you get these big blank lots, like right in the middle of the city, you know you're in a good area. So that was one of the things that attracted us most to it was we had kind of been there and had already done some builds in the area. So we're very comfortable with it. And we're like, yeah, let's do this. So how much did you think you were going to sell the townhomes in the early phase of your development? If you built these out, went vertical and built those townhomes, what do you think you would have sold the first one for? So we had them penciled at 250000 per townhome originally. I want to say it was like 250, 265. And the builder we sold it to, which was LGI Homes, they built it and sold it to one build to rent buyer, which was, um, I think Avenue One was the one that they sold it to. Do you know what they got per door on that? Uh, yeah, it was a little under 300000 per door. So it was in the 290s. Okay. 
Did you know they were going to get that amount when you sold that to them? Was that like a question you asked? No, them no, I, I did not no. think that they were going to get that amount. So it was <laughs> it was pretty surprising. I'm like, dang, man, we could have gotten an extra $50,000 per house if we build. But no, it was a great deal. It, it exceeded our IRR expectations. And, you know, again, in, in this environment where it's getting a little bit harder to raise money, right? People are kind of stepping back. They're being more conservative. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a strategy that we sort of stumbled into. And I mean, now we've we've got a lot in the pipeline that are slated just for this right now. So I've always thought that it's not my job to tell the market what it wants. It's its job to tell me what it wants, and it's my job to give it to it. What was the purchase price when you bought and maybe the size of the lot that you put the 36 townhouses on? I want to say that it was like three acres, two, three acres. I mean, it wasn't huge, right? You know, townhomes are great because you can put density in it. It was only one road. It's like a little L and we just threw them up on each side and there. It wasn't like the slope was already there. I mean, every, it was the perfect site to do this kind of development, we were all in on, let's say we bought it for $500,000 and I want to say we put somewhere around 36,000 per pad into it. So bought it for 500, put 36 per pad into it. And then we ended up selling it for 60, I think 68.5 per pad. I want to say somewhere around there. Okay. So you delivered the finished pads to that builder then. Yep. Okay. Interesting. When they approached you to sell it, Brandon, were you already under construction for those pads or was it still in sort of the paper approval stage? And they were like, you need to build it out and then we'll close on it. It was already getting put in roads and curb. I mean, everything was slated. They could tell that there was something going on there and they came and knocking uh, at our door. Nice. So 50 to 10. So maybe it's like what 30 32k per door profit something like that or per pad I guess I should say. <laughs> uh man I wish I had a calculator right now. I, that's why I gave you the numbers. I don't know off the top of my head. It was a really good deal. I remember like we were like excited about it like oh my god we need to do more of this immediately. And that ended up uh we immediately after we close that deal we're like do you want the one across the street because we're about to do the same thing and they were like <laughs> yes we do and we go well let's do the same deal and we ended up getting more per pad for that one because it was single family detached homes and not townhomes so higher sell price for them higher pad purchase price for us nice um what was right what year did you buy that land do you recall 21 i, I think 22. it, it must have been 22 right uh, we bought the land in Q1 of 21, I want to say. Q1, I'm pretty sure. I'm not, not Q1, Q4 of uh, 21. I think we bought it in December 2021, that first one. Okay. How long did it take you guys to get the approvals before you could put a shovel in the ground to start your construction? The better half of a year. It took us wow. roughly a year for us to get all the approvals and everything in place on it. So, you know, we had to jump through through some hoops to get that one done. Okay. So maybe we're talking Q1 of 2023 that the construction actually started? Let's see. We bought it in Q4 of 2021. And uh, we got, yeah, it took a while to get all the struggles in place. We started it in... I want to say the spring. Yeah, it was the spring of 2022. And uh, because we had to wait for the winter and everything to kind of pass. And yeah, it took us approximately one year for us to develop and sell those pads. Oh, oh, so the year included the construction of the pads then. So it took us uh, it took us about eight, nine months to buy it. We had to do all the due diligence period. So eight, nine months. We closed on it in Q4 of 2021 after we did our due diligence, got everything passed. And then it took us, uh, we had to wait three or four months through the winter time to kind of, you know, get through the rainy season and stuff. And then we started actually developing it in Q2 of 2022. And then it, then we sold it in Q2 of 2023. So a full year to uh, develop the pads and sell the pads. Okay. That makes sense. And then the five or six or seven months while you're under contract, Am I right in assuming that the approvals from the county and the city and everybody with your plan, all that took place while you were under contract? 
Yeah, we don't buy anything until we can build the value into the land and the approvals are in place. And we've got all our bids in and we understand what the horizontal is going to cost. Gotcha. Yeah, so that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. The 500 grand doesn't feel as risky because when you first said 500, I'm like, man, 500,000 for three acres. If I was just stroking the check. No, that's 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 <laughs> number one. Do not do with land is you do not buy anything until you've got all your approvals in place. You can go pull a grading permit from the city. Everything's done and you've got your final civil drawings approved and can be bid by all the contractors necessary to get a rough estimate of what it's going to cost. Nice. So that's a that's a true land development deal. And then if we circle back and, and the timelines and why I'm being so specific with the timelines, Brandon, is I'm really trying to paint for myself and the listeners. I'm trying to paint a picture of the various markets that we've been through from, say, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, now in December, where we're at, because in my 15, 18 years since 2006, being in the market and studying the market going back, let's say, to probably the 70s, now that we've all looked back at the uh, last super high interest rate type of market and trying to just build some context of how volatile the market has been during this time period. So if we went to 2021 and the interest rates were super low. I see in the comps, and I know of people, because they're calling me now trying to sell me their deals, right? They see my TV commercial, they're calling, Dan, hey, you know, we got this such and such acre lot and we paid $2 million for it with no approvals, with nothing, with trees there and current zoning, right? So in 2021, the market was so freaking hot, Brandon, that all over the country, there were land deals getting purchased by people with a big checkbook and- I don't know if it was ignorance, willing ignorance of risk, you know, or the willingness to take on that kind of risk that they did with the entitlements, not knowing what the next step was. Mm -hmm. uh, but they certainly didn't do what you just described doing on this deal, which a quarter for 2021 closing and a negotiation earlier in 2021 when the market was red hot. Congratulations. That was a phenomenal deal that you were able to put together with due diligence and approval to then get it closed at 500 and maybe 500 was a, a high price. I mean, what would you have paid for that land if the seller said it? No, I don't care what the number is, but give me, give me this number without the approvals. Was there a number or is there a number that bobs to mind that you would pay for that same lot? I mean, knowing what you know now, it's obvious, but back then, if you could kind of transport yourself in time. Yeah. Great question. I, I know that in that market, we definitely don't want to be over 20,000 per pad. So if it's, you know, 36 homes is what we could go there. I know I would not want to be over whatever number that was. I know we got a really good deal. If I am in it at $10,000 or less uh, per home on my approvals, I, I mean, our development cost rarely goes over 50,000 per pad. And so I know pads in that market are going for, uh, you know, now, you know, 80 to $90,000, you know, there's, there's plenty of margin there for us to be able to do something and bring investors in, et cetera. So if we went to 2021 and it was in Q2 of 2021 and you were talking to the seller or the agent, was this one off market or was this agent listed property? Off market. Most everything we do is off market. Let's say that seller said, Brandon, I'm not waiting until Q4 to close. I want a 30-day closing. What price is that? And you're going to take all that approval risk on your plate. What, what number would you have put there? Uh, I would have to assume the value in place. Let's see. If I know that I sell it, uh, if I had a, like, let's see here. God, there's so many variables here. Now we don't do anything unless we've got a contract from an end buyer so we know exactly what our exit is before we we buy it. So we've got a contract in place with a builder at a per pad price. Here we didn't. For me to go and not have a builder lined up to buy it, which we didn't at the time, and I would not be able to get any of the approvals in place at all. So justify building 36 townhomes on it. I, that, that's a question mark. And I were to say, Brandon, if you were to, Buy it as is right now, two and a half acres. And what would you have paid for it to feel comfortable? Well, you could have only built 
two homes on it. And those homes, those pad prices are going for like 80, 90,000. You probably get a premium because you're getting a whole acre. I don't think I would have paid more than $190,000, $200,000 for it without any approvals okay. in place to take all the risk of that because I know that I could at least build two homes on it and yeah, the deal still pencil. Yeah, and that's coming from a place that you had already done new construction, ground up, paid for the lots, understood what it would cost to go vertical and had some finger on the pulse of the market. The number I was thinking, I'm like, man, I wouldn't pay. I mean, I didn't check the comps. I don't know the numbers at all, but I'm like, man, 75, 80 grand times. 500K with all the approvals, 75 grand cash tops today if I'm taking all the risk. I mean, that's probably too cheap and I'm I'm out in left field with that number. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> hey man, it can't hurt to ask. Always ask. You don't know when they're going to say yes. So let's, let's dive through that same, I mean, it's been a year and a half, I believe it was June, 2022 when we last talked and you were excited. And what happened is you had built new construction, but you had pre-sold the construction. And one of your uh, jewels of wisdom, if we shall call it, was don't pre-sell the property because the market went, I don't know, five or 10% higher. The costs went five or 10% higher. And what normally was a good thing, most of the time before COVID, reselling new construction was great. You could get financing from the bank. It was a, a favorable situation to pre-sell completely units. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, you can't do that because the market's so volatile and the construction costs went nuts and it's just the inflation crushed us as we did that. Um, where is your heart? with the new construction now maybe you could talk about kind of what has happened in that year and a half with going vertical meaning the building of homes on the finished pads because you were really excited about that i believe last time we talked and now you're at a different place would you mind elaborating on that yeah so you've got a great memory june 2022 so things have changed a lot since then back then you're right. We had crazy construction costs, and I, I was not pre-contracting anything because if you've kind of pigeonholed yourself into an end price and then all of your costs continue to escalate on you, well, that's just profit that's getting squeezed. And so, yeah, it didn't make sense for us to contract or pre-contract anything back then. Today, different story. You've seen supply chain issues ease. You've seen costs come back down. Lumber is not as crazy volatile as it was back then. It's funny just to see like a 25-year lumber chart and watch it go completely <laughs> vertical and, and just bounce back in the 2020, 2021, and uh, I think late 2022 phases. Now, I, I'm okay with pre-contracting. If you know we've got 10 townhomes that we're uh, you know, looking at building, and it's kind of right behind some of the stuff that we already talked about. So similar area. And so I'm already talking with the build the rent fund that bought the, you know, the 36 townhomes and, and I'm like, Hey, uh, you want to, you want to buy 10 more? And so we're, we're fine to pre-contract out because we feel like the construction costs have leveled out and they're a lot more stable and we're not seeing the same supply chain issues that we had. So a little bit of supply chain issues, but not near what it was. If you were going to allocate your business and maybe we talked about going vertical and new construction, and that's some percentage of your business in the future going forward. And then we also talked about doing the horizontal construction. And we would say to include in that category, the curbs, the utilities were delivering finished pads. And then one thing I think we might've alluded to a little bit was maybe you were selling a project without actually doing the construction to another builder or developer who's going to do the horizontal construction. And maybe that's a third percentage of your business going forward. Is Are there any other categories of the business going forward that I missed in those three? We either have you know paper lots or we have horizontal construction and then we have vertical construction. Are there any other categories that you would see in your own business going forward or are those three pretty much make it up? Those three pretty much make it off. We do some one-off deals and some other syndications. You know, I'm a limited partner in a lot of uh, apartment complexes. I like the depreciation. We're looking at some really good commercial deals that are seller financed, uh, but those are kind of few and far between. We're mostly doing those three that you just named. Okay. And what percentages in an ideal world, you wave your magic wand, 
and uh, you can allocate percentages of the business in what you think is maybe lowest risk versus maximum profitability versus maybe the lowest drag on your time or other considerations. What do you think the percentages would allocate if you had that ability in the future for those three categories in your business going forward? Yeah. So here's how we're adjusting. You know, when we last spoke, 80% was vertical construction and 20% was developing and selling the finished lots. Right now, in this day, right now, because of what's happened with interest rates and everything else, an allocation I would love to get where we're 40 to 50% entitling land and just selling the land because that's the lowest risk. You don't have a lot of capital tied up. Your risk is putting it under contract, spending forty or $50,000 on civil fees, and your, your deal not working. You're not be, being able to find a buyer for it. So that offers the least risk, and there's huge returns for the right parcels of land where you can take it from a couple homes to like 100 homes. There's a ton of value you can add there. So right now, that offers the highest upside with the least amount of risk. I would add that another 30% would be developing the pads and selling them with an in contract already in place by the builder with a eight to 10% deposit released towards the development. So if I'm, you know, right now we're getting ready to uh, do about 74 pads for a builder. Uh, you know, we want, we're, I think our exit on that's like 6.7 million total. I want a $670,000 deposit released to me and they can get a deed of trust and uh, and have a have a second position behind our investor base and the, and the loans that we put on it. So doing those deals where we already have an in buyer lined up for the lots with a significant deposit with a lot of value add there, I'd like that to be at least you know 20 25 probably 30% of the business. And then really where we're changing things is we were at 80% on our vertical builds, and we're probably going to be scaling that down to about 20% as far as transactional volume goes. If I mentioned on this, like we're really wanting to get some of our vertical builds to pencil for build to rent. And, you know, if that's the case, then I would look at adjusting that going forward and probably increasing it. You know, we're because the transactional volume is so great with the with the developed pads in the land right now. You know, we don't see any need to increase a longer transactional timeline to get cash into the business. We're we're good there. So if we do do any vertical, it's going to be more you know build to rent. How do we hang on to this long term? How do we create cash flow? How do we recapture some depreciation and offset some of our transactional business? So is the the push the willingness even to keep 20% of the vertical build, like to go from in a year and a half, 80, 20, 80% vertical, 20%, all this other stuff for that to have completely flipped and shifted. It would beg the question of, well, why bother with any vertical building at all? If that's highly risky and that's where I've gotten in any jams, is that motivated by, um, building high quality assets and capturing the depreciation because that's like a tax offset uh, mechanism to the other more profitable components of the business? Or are there other motivations that you and your partners have for wanting to even hang on to 20% of the vertical? Really, it boils down to land that we're already sitting on that is in our backyard. We've built in that area and we've adjusted the product to the market. So we were building homes that were, you know, in this particular pocket where one of the deals in it's a, it's a 10 build. It was six, seven, hundred thousand dollar homes, semi custom, Gucci'd out, really, really nice, like downtown views, rooftop decks, lights underneath the stairs, waterfall <laughs> countertops. I mean, you know, like I'm like, dude, I want to live in this. This is awesome, right? Really high price point. That really got crushed with the whole rise in interest rates. And so, if I can build a five hundred thousand dollar home in that same area cookie cutter over and over again and get my costs from $179 a foot down to $130 a foot and be at a price point where there's less than two months of inventory and stuff's moving, I'm okay doing that uh, because the ROI for me is in the risk compared to the risk and the effort involved is still really, really low compared to if, you know, I just sold 10 lots, right? So it's, we're, we're more motivated to build if it's like a 10 lot deal, that's not very big. I don't really want to sell that because there's not a lot of cash that it's going to generate. It's just not a big deal versus, you know, we're doing, you know, 30 to 200 unit 
uh, developments right now where we're entitling it and, and getting zoning approval on it, you know, selling the land, selling the lots, it becomes a lot more interesting when you have that kind of volume that's associated with the land. Whereas if it's just like, you know, a 10, 20 unit deal, you got to make it worth your while. And to do that, it makes more sense to build because the higher, the margins are a lot higher on the homes than if you were to, you know, develop it and just sell the pads. So in a sense, some of the motivation is, You've got these 10 lot, I don't know what they are, acre, three acre, four acre, and it's too small to really make a meaningful profit by putting it through the other 80% now. So you're building that out so that it's a reasonable profit. To yeah, building it out. Deal. Yeah, building it out and looking at maybe even doing like a little small test run on build to rent, right? Because it's a newer strategy. We haven't done it before. And it's great to test it on a small little portion. I really like it because... Dude, if it doesn't work out, you can just sell the homes, right? You know, it's kind of different than an apartment complex. You're, I mean, you got to rent those things out. You've got one exit strategy, right? So we're looking at maybe trying it on a much smaller scale and just seeing how it works. Some of the things that are interesting is the adjustment of your product to the market. And I don't know if a lot of investors pay as close attention as I do personally to the year built of the vintage. And what I mean by that, I grew up in a house that was built, I believe, in like 1933 or 1934. And there's other houses on the same street that were built in like 1925 and 1927. The 1925 and 1927 houses were built with these like nice, I think they're granite. We had granite quarries, I think, right in Drexel Hill outside of uh, Philadelphia. Um, big, thick stone facade uh all the way around the side and then the house that we grew up in that was built in the great depression 1933 it's it was the lowest lot on the street so the street kind of had some hills and there must have been like a creek or something running through so we kind of had this like muddy backyard that we could never cure growing up <laughs> uh so it must have been the least desirable lot the last one on the whole block to get filled in and ours was just frame and stucco house. Nice house, four uh, four bedroom house, you know, it was a nice house. But there were like two or three of that model on the block that were in that era when construction was very likely tight as it just tightened up on us here in the last 18 months. Mm -hmm. And you can see that same dynamic occur from stuff that was built in like the late 80s, getting into like 92, 93, 94, really tight construction years then. And then when you yep. get into the boot building boom, we had 01, 02, 03, 04. And it's not going to be the case everywhere in the country because certain markets had a lot more building, let's say, in the 2000 to 2007 era than other markets may have had. And I think we're we're uh, in, an, in a period of adjustment per your story here going from the 700k builds with all the bells and whistles to something a little less square footage perhaps mm -hmm. in the bedrooms uh and a little less you know pizzazz on the finishes and the designs and i just i just find that is a very interesting it's like the rings on a tree brandon right it's like you can see when they had the rainy seasons when that you know based on the evidence and those houses are here uh the proof is in those houses and they're going to be here for all of history to kind of indicate the liquidity of the real estate market when they were built. <laughs> it's really funny you mentioned that. I remember when we were flipping a lot of houses, I'd go to these like 700, 800, 900 square foot, like two bed, one bath homes or three bed, one bath homes. And I'm like, why in the world would a builder build this? Huh? This doesn't make sense. Who would buy this? Then when you look back and you look at like, the cost to construct and, you know, interest rates and what they were in the late sixties and, and early seventies, you're like, Oh, that's all anyone could ever afford back then was that kind of home. So yeah, it's funny to see the parallels as you just demonstrated. I like how you use the rings around the tree concept to go and say, we're kind of experiencing some similar stuff in the past. And Hey, here's maybe why you saw so much smaller homes and why you're more than likely already seeing smaller homes be built today because affordability i'd say is probably the number one driver for you know new home construction right now and it's a big reason why you know warren buffett he just made headlines two months ago investing like 900 million into dr horton ron homes and i think it was dr horton all those guys build entry-level homes right you got 35 percent 
of the home buying population, millennials that are at prime home buying age, and they can't afford anything. And you, there's a really interesting chart that shows the difference between your rent rates and your cost to own a home rates. And you can kind of see at the times in history where they sort of zigzag past each other. And you can tell, ah, oh, you know, that's the best time to rent. Ah, oh, you know, now's the best time to buy a home. And if you look at that chart now, after this black swan event in interest rates, this historic rise, the gap has never been greater. It has never been more expensive to buy a home compared to rents today in history. Wow. Yeah, and when you when you see that, right? So more the context of the current market. I mean, I think it was October was like the I forget the headline, the lowest number of pending sales since two thousand and one, or since they ever tracked it, or whatever the case was. And that was when the interest rates kind of peaked out. Hopefully, we'll knock on wood. Um, at like just about eight percent, I think. And then the Fed had the meeting, and now they're signaling we're going to see a handful of rate decreases. Hopefully, come twenty twenty four. And then in November, I saw another headline that said builder sentiment was at its highest, you know, since, I don't know, a year before, whatever the case was. Uh, and then we have the evidence that you already talked about today on this show, Brandon, where you were able to sell these this variety of lots, six or 700 units coming on and dealing with some of the public home builders. And they're coming off the sidelines. And I know a lot of real estate investors who fix and flip houses are sitting on the sidelines and are... Uh, very nervous about what it's going to look like with the affordability being uh, uh, the cost being so high that the affordability is the challenge. And it's like, how much longer can people, are they going to be there if I buy a house on December 21st, 2023? Is the retail buyer going to be there in March or April when I finish my fix and flip? Or is there going to be another 8% October type of scenario that I, I have to pay, you know, I lose my $50,000 in profit that I thought I was going to make on my fix and flip. And I think that question is on a lot of people's mind. But if we're looking at the home builders and we're looking at the Fed signals and a lot of people are thinking it's at least going to be stable where it's at, but we're starting to see a downtrend in the interest rate. A lot of people are starting to feel pretty good about the prospects of what 2024 is going to look like. Do you have some opinions on 2024? Maybe you could share some insight that you've gleaned in dealing with public home builders throughout your transactions in the past six to 12 months. You know, volatility, right? If anyone tells you they got a magic crystal ball, they're lying to you. What's interesting about this environment, there's so many big forces pushing on each other that it's hard to tell what's going to happen. It's kind of like shoving a bunch of uh, deflated balloons in a box and blowing them all up at the same time. <laughs> One of them's going to pop eventually and they're all going to like shift in that direction. That's kind of what you have right now where, you know, like one of those balloons is, is interest rates, right? You've got another balloon, which is supply interest rates have gone up. Maybe they'll come back down, but you've got this supply issue where there's over 65% of homes that have an interest rate. That's like less than five and a half percent. So no one wants to give up that interest rate. So you've got a lot of supply that's being kept off the market. You know, you've got a lot of rentals that are kind of kind of come due at that five year mark. There's a lot of there's this big, you know, tsunami of commercial debt that's coming due. It's like two trillion dollars. We've already seen the cracks on the wall with that. So that's going to be a big part of the the real estate world because it affects banks and banks affect all types of real estate because they lend to it. And then you've got this supply uh, shortage, right? At the same time of homes, depending on who you ask, we're four to six million homes short across the United States. You know, if you look at just full production, we're able to do like, you know, 1.7 million per year. So by professional estimates, you know, we're, we're four, five, six, maybe even seven years away from being able to catch up to that. So any way you slice it, there's like a story for both sides here on what's going to happen. I definitely don't know. I, I predict a lot of volatility in, in the real estate market in general. I think single family has kind of seen the worst of it, in, in my opinion. Sellers are kind of coming around to the new reality. Like, you know, we're not going to see three, four percent rates anytime soon. And I think everybody, there's been so much bent up demand. What I've heard from agents in my market, there is so much bent up demand from buyers. They're just like, I need something, but 
Ugh, man, like I just really don't want to pay that rate. They're looking for an excuse to jump in. So if I see, I think that if we see a little bit more softening with interest rates, especially if the Fed starts coming down, I think you're going to see a huge push from buyers to enter in and be like, dude, it's come down. Let's like, let's jump on it. So I think that that's something that you're going to see. It's going to be interesting to see how the commercial debt and how the office space plays out with you know this this new world where you know no, most people are, are, are work more are working from home than they did before covid and so is that space going to bounce back or is it going to have to is inventory going to have to be absorbed by something else i think you could see this great condo conversion story here pretty soon if the downtown office spaces don't experience some kind of back uh bounce back um, so my, my prediction is I think there's going to be a lot of volatility. It's going to be very difficult to see what's really going to happen. Yeah. It's funny. You say the volatility. And I remember, uh, last year, <laughs> December, 2022, we were all trying to catch our, uh, get our win back after we were, you know, punched in the gut with the interest rates collectively. Um, and it was a, somewhat a state of shock. But I remember the real estate values, let's say $450,000 house in June, uh, same house is probably maybe going to sell exact condition. If you were trying to sell it in December, we're probably talking 380000 for that same house. And, and at the time, I didn't think it was going to recover. I thought, oh, here we are. This is 2007, 8, 9. We're back into that same kind of a dip. Um Luckily, the spring market came and that same house that was $380,000 in December, that same thing probably sold for $445,000 the following year. Now, that's just based off charts on a number somewhat, right? You look at the real estate sales price overall of history, it cycles up and down every December. It always dips in December. It always does. But it was a dramatic dip in this past December. And it didn't quite hit, at least from my view, the high water mark. I also say that based on actual examples of houses that I passed on at a certain point in December. And then when they sold in April, it looked like such an obvious deal. I'm like, how did I manage to miss yeah. that deal? I just didn't think it was going to recover or have that kind of confidence that, that we were going to be able to make that go. So the volatility... I hope that's the same volatility that we're experiencing right now. And if the prices get back to 440000 in that example, come March or, eight, March or April, I'll be happy. But one thing you have to consider um, with you know the average price report or the median home price itself, that's the other thing that's going to impact that, Brandon, is the median home price was 700000 on the houses that you built a year ago. And now the median price, you you did, let's say, five transactions at 700 grand. One, one was six, whatever, right? 700,000 you did. And they were nicer houses built in a different era like we were just talking about. And now if we take the next six houses that sell from today through April, six houses, but these are $500,000 houses. So the median house price is effective, but there were still units and there was still new construction moving. So the volume still may occur, but we may be building a less expensive house, and that's going to be reflected in that medium home price value. So the market may not actually be crashing, and we still are very likely going to have a strong level of intrinsic value in houses, uh, I think, I hope, in 2024. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're right. I don't think it's any kind of crash or anything like that. It's You got to understand – 2020 and 2021 and and the first half of 2022 those with the interest rates it still wasn't a normal market but th those weren't normal markets right from covid yonder uh, you, you mean you almost have to just discount those and go back to 2019 because of everything that had happened to get the real picture of how things are going yeah and it doesn't i mean i would i i think i mentally was trying to go back to 2019 with the prices and I bought uh, a second home in Florida uh, last year, and the interest rate I think is seven and a quarter or seven and a half percent. And when I bought my my other house in Chicago, in I guess it was like early 2020, it was probably like March, April, June, sometime I think in 2020, maybe even December, but that interest rate was probably three percent. 
but I had to do this mental gymnastics and this like coming to grips with reality. And it was almost hard. It was almost this like mental challenge. I went under contract and I knew the interest rates were seven and a quarter, but then I had this internal struggle and battle of, am I really going to pay seven and a quarter? And like someone quoted me six and 0.85 and I thought I'd get that. And that was like the rationalization to myself. Okay. Six and 0.85. It's not seven. Um, <laughs> that guy couldn't get the mortgage done. And I ended up paying the seven and a quarter and going to settlement. And like, it didn't kill me. I'm alive on the other side of it. I've made all my payments. And I imagine that uh, any given avatar home buyers out there, and they're going to have that same struggle, that pent up demand. They're, they're right now having some of that struggle. But the one thing that a lot of the pent up demand does not have is they may not have the recent experience of buying another house a year prior at 3%. So they didn't even know. They don't even know what they missed. A lot of people who are going to be first time home buyers coming into the market who you're now building these $500,000 houses for. It's kind of like most people when they went to the car dealership and bought their first car. I didn't know what interest rates were. As long as you didn't have like totally dinged up damaged credit and you weren't paying like 17% interest or something like that, it was probably yeah. somewhere between six and 9%. And you didn't even look at that or know how that affected the math on the paper. You were like, $385 a month for 60 months. I can do that. Yeah. No notion of the interest rates. And so I think a lot of the pent up demand probably has that. And then some portion of it's going to have the rationale I just described. And I think that you're absolutely right. If the rates tip down slightly and get under that seven mark, I think a lot of people will be able to quickly rationalize going out and pulling the trigger. And it, it should um, sustain at least the demand I think that we have uh, currently in the marketplace. What do you think is going to happen in 2024 onward? I think we're in a stable market. I think there's a lot of markets that I see with my own eyes. So we're in Atlanta, we're in Chicago, we're in Philadelphia. Those are physical offices we have, but we buy houses in, you know, we did one in Florida. I have one I'm going to close on in Tennessee. I have one right, I think it's right outside of Nashville. I forget the name of the town. Uh, we just did one in Indiana. So we have deals in a lot of markets and we look at a lot of different markets, but the Chicago, Atlanta and Philly markets within each of those markets, I don't know what there is, 20, 30, 50 little micro markets. There are a lot of micro markets such as like the South side of Chicago, where it's not that there's a lot of pain and the values for renovated houses are still higher than they were in 2019. But on the low end, um, when when they're kind of beat up and they need the renovation, let's say the houses in the neighborhood are selling for 270 grand all fixed up. Um, when the market kind of got nuts, they were selling for like 135 cash, let's say, maybe 125. And now you're seeing downward pressure on that lower end of the market. So those houses are probably selling for 65 to 85 and maybe 95 or 100 on the top end and they're still worth that 270 ish mm -hmm. and maybe the spring comes and we'll go for 285 290 it's it's a really good position for those neighborhoods which have historically been challenged because at least there's values there where people can capture some of that who are selling at the bottom end who can no longer care for the houses their state houses whatever the case is so it's possible to do deals there. And in 2019, a lot of those kind of neighborhoods, it was impossible to do a deal there, meaning like the property needed a hundred grand and the retail sale was, you know, 130. <laughs> and the place had 10 grand in back taxes. You could not even do the deal there. So the house sat there on renovated. And so I guess where I'm going with it is I think there's pockets. And I think it's mostly going to be pockets where you would see a lot of cash sale activity happening. And there is not a ton of that in a Nashville, Tennessee type of market. It's a younger market. Uh, it's it's quickly matured over the past 10 to 15 years, let's say, meaning a lot of investors bought and a lot of homeowners moved there to make it their home. So it's not going to be a tremendous amount of distressed inventory. But if you have areas like West Philadelphia, some parts of South Philadelphia, North Philadelphia, these have been challenged for a very long time with a lot of distressed inventory. 
Same with like South side of Chicago. Um, Atlanta is a market that had pockets of these distressed inventory. And over the last 10 years, that inventory has been bought and renovated. And there's still some, but it's nowhere near like we would see in those other markets. But anywhere that there's like, when you pull the comps and you see cash sales in that neighborhood, those cash sales have taken a hit, probably 25% maybe even 30% on the low end, but the retail sales are still holding up well. Now, if you go out into any of the other areas with historically low inventory, um, those markets really haven't taken much of a hit, right? Other than maybe like the dated house that needs a bunch of work, that's probably taken a 25% hit in value in this market. I think those same hits in value that we saw here in the last 12 months, I think that's going to carry forward into 2024. And it may even on the low end, it may even go down a little bit more because construction costs are still higher. They're still much higher than they were in 2019, even with the stabilization of the building supply chains and the cost mm -hmm. of lumber and things of that nature. It's it's a lot of times right now, it's like the labor still very, very tight. So I think we're in a stable market and I think there's going to be some discounting uh, throughout the marketplace. But, you know, if we do see these interest rate uh, tickoffs, I think that's going to be enough. I don't think the demand this year is going to equal the demand last year, but I think that the tick down in interest rates could keep that demand steady mm -hmm. from last year. So I hate to use, I hate to look into the crystal ball and say like a soft landing or anything like that. Yeah. Cause it's, it's still. <laughs> <laughs> you're on recording people can go back and listen to it right <laughs> i know i know i'm gonna shut up now <laughs> <laughs> so we did i i mean we talked markets and i mentioned a couple markets around the country and the tennessee the state of tennessee has been on my radar now for i don't know two years and we've done a handful of deals in tennessee and i'm not going to be like the new king of tennessee and i'm not going to open an office there but I'm excited about Tennessee. I love when we see a house come through and there's a chance we can do, you know, do the fix up to it and resell it because I really just have this good gut feel about the prices in Tennessee. Now I'm not building three quarter million dollar custom homes. It's not new construction. My ideal house is built in 2001. Let's say I'm going to put 30, 40 grand in it, and it's probably going to sell for 300,000 and change. It's going to fly off the shelf because it's first time home buyer product. Um, I'll do an older house. I'll do a bigger house, smaller house, you know, whatever the case is, if the numbers make sense. Um, but the supply constraint that I've witnessed almost without exception across um, North Carolina and across Tennessee have been phenomenal. Right. I, I liked Atlanta the way I like Tennessee and North Carolina as states. I still like Atlanta. I think that that entire section of the country is still seeing population growth. And from what I see in the numbers from doing comps and evaluating deals there, I can't say it's this percentage in this metric. I can just say that my gut feel every time I check check comps and I'm doing a deal in Tennessee or North Carolina, it looks still strong. It's still one of my favorite uh geographies even though we don't have offices there when we get a deal i'm excited about that do you have more meat to put on the skeleton of my uh enthusiasm we'll call it for the tennessee market or maybe just the nashville market that you're the expert in yeah i so i'll tell you why we like it right you know because at the end of the day i can only give my opinion on it men lie women lie numbers don't lie there's a lot of different reasons why we like middle tennessee anything around nashville one is because it doesn't have state income tax, right? And when you have are putting money back into small businesses and consumers' pockets, you know they want to be there. So it's a very, very compelling play when you're looking at that overlaid with the other demographics, which is a big one that's kind of here recently is COVID sort of revealed this environment that everybody knew was there, but – made it a lot more obvious. And that is you got business friendly states and you got not business friendly states. And the whole goal when you're looking at an area, in my opinion, like the the number one thing that I look at is, is money going to continue to pour one into the asset class that you're investing in and two into the area that it's in, 
right? And when you look at Nashville, that's just this huge influx of people. It's been one of the top 10 fastest growing cities in the United States the past, you know, six, seven years. Money moves to an area, people move to an area, you get insulation. It is incentivizing these larger businesses to move there. So from a local perspective, the uh, local politics has done a good job of incentivizing the Amazons, the Oracles, the Alliance Bernstein to like set up shop there. I mean, if you look at the downtown skyline since 2011, it's more than doubled, right? There's a lot of institutional money that's being poured into Nashville because they see the opportunity. Again, you know, COVID was a big part of that. From 2011 to 2018, you had about four to five billion dollars of institutional money that was being poured into the downtown core area under constructions. That's five billion over a seven year period. To date, right now, you've got over five billion being built. So the amount of institutional capital has multiplied that's pouring into it. And again, that's because we didn't shut everything down, right? You know, there was this huge influx after COVID to Florida, to Texas, and Tennessee. Because we didn't shut everything down. So uh, we're seeing a great migration from these these high tax states, these highly regulated uh, states, you know, New York, California, New Jersey, and they're all moving to these business friendly states with low taxes uh, where it's very easy to do business. So just from that alone. Uh, it's compelling. If you look at some of the more microscopic demographics, you've got year-round tourism. It's music city capital of the United States. The tourism literally doesn't slow down, so it's not cyclical. And Nashville's just set up for success. You look at other cities in Tennessee like Chattanooga where you're limited by the mountains, and Nashville was this just kind of perfect storm for um, for development and gentrification where you know the downtown area and the surrounding spots around it they they were not they were the least attractive you didn't want to go down there and recently since it's been a boom city you've just seen that change you've flip flopped it right you know the millennial buyers they want something that's close to downtown you've just seen this great gentrification in these areas so there's been a lot of money that is that has moved into it and whenever money moves into something that's where i want to be nice nice Speaking of moving money, last time we talked, you were uh, raising capital. Are you still in the business of raising investor capital, or have you just switched to a self-fund model? No, we're we're always raising money. Doesn't necessarily mean we'll always have the deal available, but we're being a lot more conservative with what we're doing going forward. But you know, we're always looking for investor partners. So when we talked last time, it was. Uh... <laughs> I think you were raising money for one of the projects, if I'm not mistaken. It may have been off the recording. It may not have been on the recording, but I think you were raising money for one of the projects that was going to be the pad development. Does that sound accurate, maybe? Uh, probably so. It might have been that same deal that we spoke about earlier, that the 36 townhomes and the 34 lots across the street from it. That's right. So, I mean, I'm like a newer investor, so I've done LPs and stuff in the last couple of years, but not like for 20 years or anything. And my first thought was, oh my gosh, this just sounds so risky. I, you know, I didn't understand the market. I hadn't done the kind of research I've done in the last year around development and paying attention to the national builders and, you know, just matured in my underwriting where it doesn't seem like as risky a deal now as it felt like when you were telling me that at the time. Um, I mean, that could be because we're looking at the $68,500 sale price and we're all, you know, 2020 hindsight kind of a thing. Um, <laughs> But but what does a deal look like? Are you able to kind of walk me through maybe what a project on the table now or recently yeah. would have looked like for me as an LP if I was going in? Uh, yeah. So you know, one right now that we're, I think we we've, we've I think I've got the capital done for it, and I'm just trying to lock in the empire. So it's it's 74 pads that we're going to be developing. It's in a market that would same market that we did that deal that you and I just discussed. Uh, we've built a lot of houses in this area, so we're very comfortable in it. We bought the land once all the improvements were in place for, I want to say it was $700,000, I think. It was seven hundred or seven fifty dollars uh, approved for 74 homes. So, you know, we, we hit our cost basis, you know, $10,000 per pad. That's where we want to see. We got our development numbers back. I think we're at $46,000 on each pad development with all of our infrastructure costs and all of our impact fees from the city. 
And right now we're getting contracts in place from builders anywhere between 80 and $90,000 per finished pad. So when, you know, when I syndicate these deals, I'm usually doing an, an, an 18% pref to investors. Um, you know, obviously I can't guarantee anything, but that's what we've been able to deliver on, on past deals. And so that's what's worked for us. And that's what we've offered on these types of opportunities. In the past, we were doing a 50% debt, 50% equity play on these development type deals because a lot of the bank financing has dried up. We've had to move to you know, basically a strictly 100% equity model uh, with investors on these types of development deals. So that's that if you were looking at just develop pads and that specific arm, uh, that's one of the deals that we're working on. Okay. What, uh, what are the risks in that specific deal? I mean, what's the downside there? Yeah, so you've always got the chance that your builder could just up and walk away from you, right? So your in buyer disappearing, say, hey, you know, keep the 10% uh, deposit, you know, we're, we're going to go do something else and you got to hang on to it. So that's why it's real important to be in an area where you've got multiple buyers, you know, in this particular deal, we got like four different letter of intents and contracts are rolled in. So we know that there's been a lot of interest. We've already moved land in this area before. Uh, we know that this is growing. We know that there's more and more builders that are moving to this specific market. It's in the path of progress per se. So there's always the risk that you could have your buyer walk and you've got to hang on to it. But when you do deals where it's 100% equity, all right, we got to hang on to it. So what? Right. It's not like half built house. You know, you put everything in the lands there, tornado comes through. I mean, it's not going to do any like big damage or anything like that. You just sit and hold on it. And uh, that's that's really the, the main risk. Your buyer pool is a lot smaller. But if you do your due diligence and you're in the areas that everybody wants to be in and there's construction, uh, I mean, that's kind of your worst case scenario. And I mean, hey, if if we really have to, uh, if we're hanging on to it. We'll just build and sell the houses on it ourselves. Okay. Yeah. So 700, three, 3.5 million in construction costs. That sounds about right. Uh, so you've got 74 Roughly. pads. We bought it for yeah. 700 and our cost per pad is, I think it's 40, 45, 46. Thousand per pad. Yeah. So your okay. all-in cost with everything is, I think you're right at like fifty four, fifty five, somewhere around there, and you're selling so like four, four point two million maybe for the total raise. There sound right? Uh, yeah, that sounds right, somewhere around there. And then the eighteen percent pref that obviously is dependent upon the success. So, like in the worst case scenario. Uh, a black swan COVID type of event happens, the market crashes, and we're like, we're all hanging on to this thing for two, three, four years. In those scenarios, maybe the pref doesn't necessarily pan out, right? Well, yeah, of course, right? That's why you can't Something guarantee like anything. But yeah, that's, uh, you know, you'd have to see your pad price go from, you know, 80 to, to 90,000 down to, you know, what your cost basis is, which in this case is like 55,000. And so it's been a long time since we've seen uh, pad prices at, at that price. So that to me gives me a lot of downside pressure there because the, the, the number one thing we want to look for is capital preservation, right? That's, that's at the top of the strategy. I think there's too many people chasing IRR and return on capital and not assessing the risks and prioritizing return of capital. Yeah, and that's where people got in trouble recently. I had uh, Rod Cleef on my show last episode, and he and I were talking about the uh, apartment house or the apartment syndicators who used the bridge debt, which had adjustable rates, and it went nuts. And these guys, to juice the returns, I don't know what they were in for, 10% down, right? It's 10% down, 90% financing. Well, the 90% financing became the dragon that came and, you know, burned down the city, if you will, on those deals. And they did. They lost all of the investor capital, whereas you're in a scenario where, you know, at a minimum, 
because there's no debt, you kind of have this staying power other than having to maybe do a, what, a capital call for property taxes or something. I mean, you know, I'm talking doomsday scenario here. Not, not right? even, I mean, the, ta the taxes are nothing. I mean, you know, the GPs can, I mean, we could, right. But I mean, we're talking like yeah. pennies here. I would just probably personally take care of the taxes. Cause it's, I mean, it's nothing. Yeah. And there, there are people who did these kind of deals, uh, you know, in the last run up, and lots did go from ninety to ten thousand or twenty thousand dollars a lot, but they ended up losing a lot of them to the bank. Now, a lot of those same people that I'm talking about who did those kind of deals, the bank maybe held on to them or the bank sold them off to someone else. And then within three to five years, they were back at the eighty five or the ninety that they were projected to be at when they were originally uh developed so it was a very short window where the debt squeezed that original developer out but i think that's smart what you're doing about the 100 percent equity and having no arduous uh financing of the three million four million dollars in construction that potentially could punch the hole to punch the hole in the deal so you have this projection do you know what uh i mean i guess it is it's 4.2 and is that the 6.2 million dollar exit roughly uh, well, you know, take 85, 86 and multiply it by 74, whatever that number comes in at. I don't know. I could probably do it real quick on my phone, but yeah. yeah I, I think mean, I think it's roughly 6.6.2 .6 is when I did the math at 85. Yeah. Then there you go. Yeah. yeah. You know better than I do. <laughs> oh, yeah. So yeah, you have this good target there for the upside. And I feel like you have some some good downside protection on being a hundred percent equity as insurance against bot super volatility in the marketplace. The only other drawback probably is there is really, is there any depreciation benefit at all to investing nope. in this? Case? Yeah. So it's no, like a that's, yeah, that's why we try to give a generous prep because yeah, when you're doing development because of your shorter time frames, you're not capturing any depreciation. Cool. Cool. So um, as we get to the wrap up here, do you have a website or somewhere if anybody was interested in getting on the list for that next deal or maybe another reason people should reach out? Uh, I mean, yeah. Anybody who wants to look up more information can go to our website, hbgcapital.net. That's harrybobgarycapital.net. I joked that the, the dot .com was taken by somebody. It was over in like uh, Saudi Arabia or something like that. I was like, dang, we missed the boat there. Couldn't get the dot .com. But uh, they can go there. We've got a free ebook on our website, 100 Questions Business Owners Ask Before Investing. I wrote that ebook because I had somebody reach out to me who uh, – he was a current investor of ours. And he's like, Brandon, I have a buddy of mine, and he lost all of his money in a real estate deal in California. Could you talk with him and just see what his options are? And it became very evident on the phone with him that you know he was green, and he just didn't know the right questions to ask. Questions reveal what you need to know about a deal, so you can very quickly gauge whether or not you want to be in something by knowing the right questions. And so I was like, dude, if we could just prevent this from happening to one other person, you know, how do we do that? And so that's why I put together that ebook. You can grab it on the website. There's a bunch of other free educational content as well. We've also got our own podcast, Recession Resistant Real Estate Radio. Uh, we got to get you. Dan on that podcast. Nice, nice. Looking forward to it. So I asked you the crown jewel of wisdom before, but now we're looking back over an 18 month window of yours and my career here. Everybody on the show's probably been in real estate. You know, maybe we got some people who just came in, but what an interesting time period this last 18 months. What would be the crown jewel of wisdom gleaned over the last 18 months in your own career? Brown jewel of wisdom over the last 18 months. Yeah, you know, be ready to pivot. It's not my job to tell the market what it wants. It's my job to make sure I'm actively listening to the market for clues about what's where it's going and then pivoting as needed. You know, we sort of stumbled into that with a lot of our development plays. And so we'll continue to listen to the market and and pivot as needed with it. Nice. And my final question, what is the kindest thing anyone has ever done for you? Man, the kindest thing anybody has ever done to me. I'm trying to think of a moment that really warmed my heart. I remember this guy, him, when I was in college or just graduated college, working for $8.63 an hour, mixing paint at Ace Hardware, this, uh, I used to tell every person that I interacted with that I was trying to get into medical device sales and ask them if they knew anybody. Like that was my <laughs> way of like, just trying to figure out how the heck to get in. I need to know somebody because none of these online applications are working out. 
And she introduced me to her, her husband, Tim. He worked for Depew Synthes and Spine, and Tim agreed to take a meeting with me. He was the first guy that, that I didn't know, didn't know anything about me, agreed to take a meeting. And I remember sitting there and meeting him, and he he gave me a book, Now Discover Your Strengths. And he was like, Brandon, you know, like, you know, you just need some experience. You know, I would go and I would talk with materials managers at hospitals if I were you. They know a lot of reps. And that one piece of advice is what just completely changed my world. Ended up getting into medical device sales and then, you know, getting into real estate and everything. But that guy took a a meeting with somebody he didn't know, wasn't going to benefit from it. And ended up sending him a message after I did eventually get into medical sales. And he's like, dude, it's so great to hear from you. Like, I can't believe this is better than like a whole quarter of hitting quota. Like, it's, I'm so glad that wow. you're doing well. So that was a moment that stands out to me. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, it's cool to hear the uh, person who maybe opened the door without knowing it at that point in time. It was kind of the, the gatekeeper to your career there. Yeah, 100%. Cool <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Hey, Brandon, I mean, maybe we'll have to get ourselves in the calendar for 18 months from now and see how uh, how things go. It's been a blast doing the follow-up episode. I really pre appreciate you circling back and coming coming on the show once again. Dude, I appreciate you having me. This was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah, you and me both. Good stuff.